Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here after four years. We had a meeting for the uh, JCFJ uh, in May 08, campaigning on women in prison in Ireland, and um, it's great to be invited back. And it's certainly true that given that the House of Lords is a somewhat strange institution, it's amazing how often we pull the government's irons out of the fire on civil liberties and criminal justice issues. And so, as to women in prison, is there a need for a different approach? The question posed by my talk today. A few weeks ago, the Irish Prison Service annual report revealed that the number of women committed to prison has doubled in the last six years. In 2011 alone, the number of men sent to prison stabilised, while the number of women in prison rose by 12%. In 2006, there were 960 women in prison in Ireland. That represented 10% of the Irish prison population. Last year, their number had shot up to 1,902, almost a 50% increase, and that comprised 16% of those held in prison. Now, it may be that this alarming increase is consequent on the nature of austerity programmes faced by countries in the European Union, involving often drastic cuts in public expenditure and the inevitable decline in public services, on which women are more likely to rely for work and, and in the conduct of their daily lives. But these figures mirror almost exactly the situation which faced me when I was commissioned by the British government to conduct a review of women with particular vulnerabilities in the criminal justice system, which was published in March 2007 by the Home Office. In the decade ending 2006, the women's prison population in England and Wales rose by 94%. The corresponding rise for men was 38%. The reason was quite simple. Courts were using custody more frequently for women for less serious offences. My report arose from circumstances surrounding the self-inflicted deaths of 14 women in prisons in England and Wales in 03, followed in 04 by a total of 13. It was immediately obvious to me that um, uh, given the numbers... For example, in November 06, there were 4,416 women in our prisons and 75,379 men. And I concluded that women were being shoehorned into a system designed for and largely run by men. Women and men are equal but different. Women in our prisons were treated in exactly the same way as men, leading to a high prevalence of institutional misunderstanding within the criminal justice system of the things that matter to women and the high level of unmet need, and the outcome was anything but equality. Indeed, when I came to Ireland in May 08, I visited the Docus Centre here in Dublin, which I considered a model for the way in which these women should be treated. And incidentally, supporting and trying to keep the Docus Centre open was one of the reasons why I came here. And when there was the crash in Irish property values, I remember saying to my late husband, the one good outcome of all of this is that the Irish government won't sell off the Docus Centre now to property, property speculators because there'd be no point in it. And of course it's still open. But I spoke to a young woman there who was near the end of her sentence. She had her youngest child, a baby, with her. I asked if she'd been in prison before. It was a risky question to ask, but she answered yes, in Limerick. Limerick is essentially a men's prison with a section for women. I asked whether there were any differences between the two places, and she replied that Douglas was much better, as she put it, because in Limerick they treat us the way they treat the men. In here, we're treated as women. Homes and children define many women's lives. To take this away from them when it may be all that they have causes huge damage to women and to their children. It's estimated that more than 17,240 children were separated from their mothers by imprisonment in England and Wales in 2010. And the proportions in terms of population are no different in Scotland. <coughs> 
And of course, because there are relatively few women in prison, there are only 13 women's prisons in England and Wales and one in Scotland, they are inevitably held far from home with little chance of family visits. This break in contact between mother and child can be truly catastrophic. When a man goes to prison, there's usually someone to keep the home fire burning and the male prison is packed on visiting days. A woman's prison isn't. Significantly, a large proportion of the children of women in prison end up in prison themselves. I met a woman who had given birth in Stahl Prison in Cheshire. She had been born there herself. And I called for the government to announce within six months a clear strategy to replace existing women's prisons with suitable, geographically dispersed, small, multifunctional custodial centres within 10 years. I was subsequently told that the conclusions of research on this proposal were that women themselves were hostile to the notion. I've no, I have no way of knowing the nature of the research, but I do know that the biggest challenge in women's prisons is not violence, as it is in men's prisons, but bullying. In a small institution, it's harder to avoid a bully. But I've been in a prison, Cornton Vale in Scotland, where the culture is reciprocal respect and absolutely no bullying, and I know it can work. A national service framework for women offenders has been issued, as has an offender management guide to working with women, so as to improve the probation response to working with women, and a set of gender-specific standards for women's prisons was established. Our National Offender Management System a service, NOMS, N-O-M-S, which used to, I used to call Nightmare on Marsham Street, which is where, they were, uh, where their office was, which I'm told is not quite so um, apposite as it was then, they developed a Women Awareness Staff Programme. Why do prison services always like acronyms? Women Awareness Staff Programme, so they can call it WASP. And that's a course which is for all staff and volunteers working with women, and that was crucial because the majority of prison staff had no idea of how to respond to the complex needs of women in prison. Indeed, earlier this year, Clive Chatterton, the last governor of Style Prison in Cheshire, one of the largest women's prisons in England, expressed his shock at working in a women's prison after over 30 years in the prison service, always in the male estate. He said he was still haunted by the sights and sounds he remembers from his time as governor and admitted being scarred by the experience. He is now, in retirement, a dedicated campaigner in the cause of women in prison. Incidentally, in one two-month period, he counted 34 women serving sentences of 12 days or fewer. It probably goes without saying that many of the women who end up in prison are sex workers. A new training programme for staff entitled Sex Workers in Prison has been developed enabling women to discuss their experiences and receive support whilst in prison to assist them in leaving sex work. And working with these women is not for the faint-hearted. The Northern Area Management Manager for Women in Prison described a 22-year-old inmate as very typical. She had frequent jail terms and parental neglect and coercion into prostitution from the age of 11, where, as she put it, she was raped ten by 10 men a day before tea time. As to other progress, it's right to say there's been some, though it's taking longer to achieve than I had hoped. The number of women on remand fell by 12% in the year to 31st of March last. And as I said at the outset, there were 4,416 women in prison in November 06. By May 2010, the number was 4,341, and on the 22nd of June last, there were 4,116, a reduction of 300 in five and a half years. Now, given the effect of the global recession and the trends in other countries, mirrored in Ireland, the fact that there's a reduction at all is, I suppose, a cause for celebration. But there's still a lot of work needed in persuading sentences, judges and magistrates, of the efficacy of alternatives to custody. In some areas, there are new and enlightened in-court schemes for diverting women from custody, including in Bristol, the city I was proud to represent in the House of Commons for 13 years. Ten women in focus events were held across England and Wales to increase, increase awareness of the gender equality duty and to engage the judiciary in the agenda for women. I'd like to report that the modest progress I've described has been maintained, but it is not the case. Some of the good progress in implementing recommendations has been lost under this government. 
The concept of a champion and clear leadership on the agenda has been lost, and the infrastructure put in place to secure the integrated approach across government for women offenders and that rose, those at risk of offending, that is, the civil service, civil servant, official level uh, criminal justice women's strategy group and the ministerial group have been dismantled. But the pressure for change will not diminish and not go away. There's a strong body of organisation in, and individuals whose determination, commitment and capacity to influence has a powerful and broad reach. For example, the Prison Reform Trust, are represented here today by Juliet Lyons, someone who was a member of my, valued member of my review group when I did my uh, report. The Howard League for Penal Reform, the 21, 22 organisations in the Causton Independent Funders Coalition, leading academics in the field like Lorraine Gels Gelsthorpe and Carol Hederman, and practitioners across the women's voluntary sector agencies. Thank goodness that the women's community projects and centres continue to work so hard and with such enthusiasm to engage with, engage with and work with these women. Furthermore, there's now no written, joined-up, cross-government strategy to reduce the numbers of women in custody and no reporting to Parliament. So it's difficult to see how momentum on progress can be maintained in evidence. But I'm still there and I shall still um, keep asking questions. The review by uh, Dame Anne Owers into the Northern Ireland Prison Service in October last year and its call for a small custodian for women in Northern Ireland, and the recent positive response to Damon Eilish and Giolini's Commission on Women Offenders in Scotland, which was published in April, both maintain the pressure for change, and both point broadly in the same direction as my report. But there are also wider levers for change at a national and international level relating to equalities and human rights issues. These are being looked at closely by campaigners and practitioners, in their efforts to secure change for women and their children caught up in the criminal justice system who can, be, who can still risk being dismissed as a minority. The Gender Duty, the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 3, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UN General Assembly Bangkok Rules in December 22, and CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. All these together prevent a powerful rationale for change. A few years ago, I was doing some ironing on a winter Saturday afternoon and was surprised to hear reference to both <coughs> my name and my report. It was a programme about two women who'd been through the women's centre re regime I had recommended. They had on reception been asked to fill in assessment forms with questions like, what had you wanted to be when you grow up? What did you think you could achieve now? Are your children proud of you? These were women who'd been in and out of prison repeatedly. They said that they thought these forms were rubbish, but they stuck with the process because it was easier than being in prison. They thought it was better than being in prison. They thought it would be an easy ride. A few years on, they were in work or further education, and they had their own accommodation together with their children. Their children were proud of them. They were asked what had become of those assessment forms which had been so ridiculed. One said hers was on her bedroom wall, the other had put hers on the fridge. And for me, that says it all. Thank you. I'm always a bit conflicted when discussing questions of marginal populations within prisons, such as children and women. Um, because as, as much as I welcome all the progress that's done with those populations, the other side of the coin remains, remains the male population, which is left out of those discussions usually. Um, now, the, the, the underlying message is, yes, we can change things for children, yes, we can change things for women, but the state with men is the way it's supposed to be, and, and that's working while it's really not. Um, so, uh, my, my question is for, for Ms. Corston. Do you think that some measures and suggestions you, or perhaps most of the measures and suggestions you've progressed for the change in women, women's prisons wouldn't work in, men, in men's prisons? And why is that so? Well, I think that at present, these arguments are easier to advance for women. For example, there was a public opinion uh, 
research, an opinion poll done in Britain a couple of years ago, which showed that 81% uh, of, of, of people questioned agree that it was much more suitable to send a woman uh, to a, a centre where her life could be turned around rather than sending her to prison. And I've always advanced the argument that if we can show that you can turn around the lives of vulnerable women in prison, that you could also sh show that you can turn around the lives of vulnerable men in prison, because certainly the profile of a lot of the younger people in prison particularly are very similar to those of, 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 of women. But of course, my argument was actually about the way those women were treated. Um, but I think a lot of the things that have been said uh, earlier on uh, about um, the trends in criminal justice have certainly been mirrored in, in Britain as in other countries, that lots of young men are now uh, stigmatized in ways that they never were before. Um, but I was asked to comment on women. But it does seem to me that if you can show that it works for women, there's a possibility then of showing that it could work for men. I just uh, wanted to respond to Ernest Corston's paper. Um, I, I particularly welcome the paper and the focus on women and women's experiences of imprisonment because I, I think that the focus tends to be on the male experience. I think that's uh, you know, largely in a way, but with uh, generating your talk, at least at the start, that male-centric experience, if you like, that exists within the prison system, whereby prisons are built for men, designed for men, run by men, and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's, it's really important to focus on the female experience. And uh, I don't think that we should ever challenge people who do focus on the female experience, in particular in relation to imprisonment, because it is a minority experience. And because it is a minority experience, it tends to be ignored. I think that's really important. And then just in relation to the figures that you gave us in, about female imprisonment in Ireland and the extraordinary rises in the numbers of women in prison over the past 10 years, nobody in Ireland is able to answer the question of why that is happening. Um, what we do know is that women who are in prison in Ireland are the most vulnerable women in Irish society. And they suffer from all kinds of, um, I suppose, abuses and all kinds of issues and all kinds of problems. And just to get back to your, the title of your paper, I think that we do need another way, a different way for women in prison. That's my comment. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> Sorry, could I just add to support that um, Christina's point? But it's a bit like the slide we had on the pecking order. Our children are treated like adults in prisons. Our women and mothers and sisters are treated like men in prisons. And our men are treated like animals in prisons. Um, so the papers are just wonderful. Uh, the problem seems to be prisons. You're absolutely right about um, the focus of the prison service upon men. I remember when I first started my um, review, uh, speaking to the person who was responsible for building, for, well, making the recommendations for building prisons, two things were said to me. One was that they were going to build a, pr a women's prison in Wales, because well, there isn't one in Wales. Welsh no women from North Wales go to Cheshire, uh, women from South Wales go to Eastwood Park near Bristol. And I said, you know, how many places? They said 300. And I said, you mustn't build that prison because if you build a prison for 300 places, you'll fill it. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I know some, late, they were Labour women, members of Parliament, and I, and I set, got them together and I said, you know, they were Welsh, I represent a Welsh constituent, and he said, it's your job to make sure this doesn't happen. And it didn't happen. And there's now women's centres in Wales, which are much more effective. But I asked this person, who was a woman, I said, um, when you're designing a, 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 a prison for women, how do you go about it? Oh, she said, we, we, we design one exactly in the same way as, as we design it for men, and then we look to see whether we should make any changes. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think that says it all.